Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the University of California, thank you for tuning in today for our June 2023 edition of the UC Alumni, Alumni Career Network. My name is Gloria Ko, and I serve as the Senior Director of Alumni Career Engagement at UCLA's Alumni Affairs, and I'm honored to be moderating today's event focused on retiring the concept of retirement. This program is part of a UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses, and we aim to equip you with information, insights, and connections necessary to launch, grow, and expand your career and professional life. Throughout today's session, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers uh, by clicking the Q&A box. So, uh, you know, be sure to use that to add any of your questions throughout the session. We will try to answer as many of the questions as possible during the event, and most likely we'll have that during our Q&A portion at the end of the session. So currently, more than half of workers today, over 55%, plan to work in retirement. And with average retirement age in the U.S. being 66, the, today the professional journey can continue into our 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s. Um, and our panel is going to talk about how the concept of retirement is changing and how alumni can think about work in a brand new way. In our events at UCLA, we often hear from alumni over 50 feeling stuck, not ready to stop working, but feeling uninspired or unenthused about the road ahead. And our panel today hopes to unpack some of those mental roadblocks and also hear from our amazing panel on insights and strategies to be excited about your next steps. And so I'm really thankful that we have some great panelists here today that are going to join us and uh, talk, share with us their expertise, their journeys, and also ways for you to think about your next steps. So coming to us from Los Angeles is Coretta Harris. Uh, she's a UCLA alumna and retired engineer. Uh, she currently serves on the UCLA Alumni Association Board of Directors and is the president of UCLA's Women in Philanthropy Organization. Next from the Bay Area, we have Larry Jacobson. He's a graduate of two UCs. He is a UC Irvine alumnus and also UC Berkeley um, and is a current retirement coach, speaker, and a leading authority on non-fiscal retirement lifestyle planning. Um, and then last but not least, super excited to have David Cooley here, who serves as the Director of Alumni Career Services at UCLA Anderson School of Management's Office of Alumni Relations, and he's been there since 2014. So super excited to have his expertise here as well. Um, and so for all of our panelists, thank you for being here today. Um, and for our audience, if you'd like to learn more about their professional bios, feel free to take a read of their uh, their biographies um, in the link that we just added into the chat. Um, but we won't, we won't waste any time. We're going to jump right into our first question to get to know our panelists a little bit. So we'd love to hear uh, from all of you quickly about your career journey and how you defined retirement before you turn 50 versus now. So why don't we start with uh, David? All right. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, the quick version is that after an initial career in advertising and public relations, I moved over to career and executive coaching initially in 2002, where I did um, work with both executive coaching and working with people that had been laid off after the dot-com bust of 2001, two, and three. Uh, that led to uh, my first role at UCLA Anderson, which was an as a career coach for the full-time MBA students, also doing corporate relations. And then, as you mentioned, Gloria, I started with the Office of Alumni Relations as a career coach for MBA alumni um, for the last, yeah, since 2014. So as far as the question, as far as defining retirement, should I hold that for later or right now? Yeah, let's go for it right now. So, you know, in my early years, I think I would have been retired by now. I, uh, back in my 20s, I would have thought, eh, 58, it's, it's about time to start ramping it down. I've done just the opposite. In fact, uh, I love my job here. I've been here a total of 17 years, just entered a master's program through NYU in executive coaching. I plan to work uh, up into my uh, 70s if, uh, if I'm still healthy and well. So I'm excited to talk to you. For those that are more interested in staying engaged, 
we'll talk about that today. Fantastic. Coretta, why don't we go, you go next. So I um, defined retirement. I said all along in my working career that I wanted to retire at 55. And then um, I pushed that out to 60 while I was working because I bought, um, bought I invested in some real estate. And so I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll work until I'm 60. But I found myself in a situation at age 56 that I was offered a retirement package. So I took the retirement package and I didn't know if I was gonna be retired or if I was gonna continue working. And uh, the short story is when I took the retirement package at 56, um, I don't consider myself fully retired. Um, I've worked a couple of times since then, but I've never looked for a job. Fantastic. How about you, Larry? Sure, uh, good day, everybody. Um, I spent 20 years in the corporate world and uh, ended my career as a CEO. And then I and I was burned out after 20 years. I decided that was enough. I sold this company. It was a small company, but I sold it. I bought a boat and I retired. Uh, I spent the next six years then sailing around the world, all the way around. And I think when I left, I had in mind that I wouldn't go back to work. So if you remember from our studies in school, we all studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And there was at the top, near the top, the second to the top is self-esteem. And that's respect and status and recognition. And I got that from my sailing trip around the world. I thought, wow, this is great what I, what I did. But when I came home after six years, I was lost. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was still missing something. And I realized that what I was missing was the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is self-actualization. And that's the desire to for creativity, purpose, meaning, fulfillment. And I discovered that through my speaking and my coaching and writing, and uh, that I focus and then I wrote a memoir about my journey, my trip. And now I focus on helping other people find and make their dreams come true. And that's where I get my satisfaction. That's where I've achieved my my. Um, uh, Self, uh, recognition, self-actualization at the top. I can't imagine sitting doing nothing. I pretty much work seven days a week and I love it. And uh, so my my idea of retirement took a completely 180, a complete 180 turn and here I am still working. Fantastic. Thank you everyone for starting us off and sharing a little bit about yourselves and how we'll move forward today. Um, for my first uh, question here, actually is for Larry and David, because of your work with your alumni or your coaching clients, oftentimes when we have you know events like this, people just want you to, they want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> but why don't we start first, I think is with a mindset. It's not just what we someone does, but how do they move forward mentally? Um, so from your work with your clients and your alumni, what are some common mental or emotional obstacles that you see? Are there common mindsets you see in your coaching sessions that, you know, people want to make a change, but often they're afraid to, you know, can you share with us some of these common obstacles you see? Um, we can go David first, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, I do encounter this, Gloria. I, I've, especially with the alums that, let's say, are roughly 53 and above, I think part of what I see is that people have this mindset that's actually kind of dated. In other words, they think how their parents thought, which is, oh, it must be over at 50 or 55. And I think the reality is the upside of technology is technology has given everyone, not everyone, but a lot more people an opportunity to re-educate themselves on new business models. They, it's given people a chance to go to ed tech, education tech websites, or even something like LinkedIn Learning to learn something in a way that we couldn't have even done 15 years ago. So part of the mindset is getting past the idea of people are going to shut me out because I'm old, and then bringing a mindset that says, I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to contribute. And I'm going to I'm going to bring as much energy as I can. And so, what I initially do with the people that are stuck in that that mindset is to really, uh, as nicely as possible, challenge them on the, those limiting beliefs and say, "Is that really what you know to be the case? Have you tested that out there? Have you have you reached out to 
some people that you know, including some people maybe you went to school with or you worked with in the past. I think they go to that negative mindset um, because that's the way it used to be, not necessarily the way that it is now. In fact, a lot can be changed by coming up to speed with um, a lot of learning platforms. Thank you, David. How about you, Larry? Um, yes, I run into a, a lot of obstacles, emotional obstacles. Um, I would say that one of the biggest is um, is the inability or unwillingness to let go of someone's career identity. Uh, you know, we identify with our careers. I mean, they make up much of our lives, and so it's understandable that it's we have a reluctance to let go of that. You know, if you're a doctor, it's like what when you stop being a doctor, then what are you? What's your identity? And so when people want to retire, almost everybody says, yes, I want to retire. Okay, you're going to retire from something. But what I tell people is, well, what are you going to retire to? And so, you know, when you want to have, what, do you, what is your encore? What are you looking to do? When you have something to retire to, it's easier to let go of your older identity. And um, so also, I think people uh, need to take the time to sit down and ponder the idea and make some sort of a plan. You know, most people spend, what I find from my clients is most people spend more time deciding which new car to buy than they have on a plan for retirement, a non-financial plan. And then I say one more, I mean, there's, a, I have all kinds, but um, one more is that a lot of people don't know what they want to do. They don't know their vision. They don't know their passion or what they want to do next. And so I try to get people to sit down and actually we do visioning exercises of how do you see, you know, what do you see yourself doing? Do you see yourself being happy doing that? Uh, is that feel good? Um, and then, you know, I mean, there, there's a whole lot more. Okay, I'll give you one more. Uh, that is uh, a lot of people, for those who do know what they want to do, they might have a big dream that they want to start a company or or, or uh, go to live in the Tuscan countryside and write the great novel. But that's a big dream and they don't know where to start. So I try to get people to break that dream down into smaller, tangible goals that they can achieve and then step by step make that happen. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> okay, we have met, we have a lot. Of, we're gonna we have more questions, so don't you worry. Okay. Um, so my next question actually is for Coretta. Um, you know, as someone who you know had an active career, you retired, but you didn't stop working, and you didn't have to go and find a job. They found you. Um, you were active in philanthropy and volunteer work. Um, how did you decide how you wanted to spend your time and resources um, in this stage of your career? So that wasn't difficult for me to do. Um, because um, unlike some of Larry's clients, uh, I knew what I wanted to do in retirement, and that was because I did a lot of philanthropic things while I was working with organizations. So I guess my message would be, um, as you're preparing for retirement, as Larry said, think about what you want to do. For me, I received a package, and it wasn't like, now what do I do next? Because I was involved in many organizations, UCLA-related, um, other outside organizations. So I didn't have to wonder what I was going to do. And the secret, uh, I would tell everybody a, a secret, don't let people know if you are involved in philanthropic organizations that you're retired. Because once they hear you're retired, they will have, they will volunteer you for everything. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't difficult for me to um, determine how my resources uh, would be spent. Uh, because I had already been doing things philanthropically while working, and I just continued to do those things um, after I stopped working. One thing a lot of people will say they want to travel uh, when they retire. Well, I, I do want to travel when I retire. I did want to travel when I retired, but I also traveled while I was working. So um, I, my message would be, you know, as, as Larry mentioned, you know, kind of think about what you want to do while you're working. Um, and it might be a little bit easier for you uh, when you retire. Great. Um, and I hope this is not throwing us off too much, but we actually got a couple of asks for Coretta. Um, if you could also answer what Larry and David talked about are common mental obstacles you've seen and maybe yourself or your, your colleagues, do you have any thoughts about that in terms of these common mindsets that you've seen people have that kept them back? 
Well, um, I can just say some of my peers, you know, some people are so married to their job that they don't think about retirement. And then all of a sudden they get close to retirement age. Um, they know financially they're able to retire, but they're not sure what they, they want to do. So uh, they either continue working or they stop working and they think that they'll figure it out. And they don't call Larry. Mm -hmm. They haven't talked to David. Um, but they find themselves, and this is, like I said, some of my peers, they find themselves consulting because going back to what they, Larry said, uh, their careers have defined themselves. They stop working um, and it's okay for a little while because they can, you know, redo the bathroom or some of those projects they plan to do. They travel a little bit and after six months or a year, they, they look up and they say, well, you know, I've redone the bathroom. I've, I've been to a couple countries I've not gone to now, what? And so they find themselves consulting rather than calling Larry <laughs> and saying, and help me, help me, help me. So, so yeah, a lot of people, like Larry said, they are very married to their career. Thank you. Um, and I see we have some questions again uh, for everyone's job title. So um, again, David serves currently as Director of Alumni Career Services for the, uh, the Alumni Affairs Office for the UCLA uh, Anderson School of Management. Uh, Larry here is a retirement specialist and he works with clients on retirement lifestyle planning. Um, and Coretta here is an alumna who is a retired engineer, but serves on our board of directors at UCLA Alumni Association. So hopefully that orients everyone for those that were curious about everyone's job titles. And we'll share ways that you can connect with each of them at the end of the session. And also it's in uh, their bios as well. That's on the link in the chat. Um, so my next question is to David, and we're gonna talk about, you know, how do you start the process of change? Um, how do you encourage, encourage your clients and your, your, your alumni to start the process of a career pivot or a career change? Maybe for those especially that want to keep working, but maybe try something new. Um, what strategies have you seen be positive or productive for them? First things I have people do is to really take account of what they're proud of. I have what I call the four foundational questions, and that kind of kicks off the initial process. And that's not just limited to those 55 and above, I've used this in the younger clients and, and alumni as well, but ultimately part of getting clarity on what you want to do going forward is really thinking about where you did your best work and what you're most proud of in the past. So the four foundational questions are, what are you known for now professionally? Like what, what do people count on you for? What do you do um, in terms of actual day to day? And really, what are you known for? The second one is what do you want to be known for? And how is that different? And really think about, okay, I've always done this, but I wish people knew that I was really good at this or this other thing. The third one is, what's the economic value of your work? Like, do you generate revenue? Do you, do you improve processes, lower cost? It doesn't always have to be a business outcome, but most of what we get hired for has an outcome that we haven't even thought of. So I'd really get people thinking about that. And then I get down to, what are you most proud of achieving? And I leave that open-ended meaning maybe it's something that you did last year or 15 years or somewhere there, but what brings you to that zone of pride? Because I think ultimately when we look at your history of achievement on one side, right? And your work history on the other side, this may be personal or professional. We start to find where those converge are some new possibilities. And in this digital era, there are sometimes roles that didn't even exist when we thought about retirement. So it's really a process of getting back to a zone of pride and also discussing the roadblocks. Are these limiting beliefs based on what you read 10 years ago or what you grew up thinking? Or have you really reality checked it in the current market where in some cases there's more opportunity, some cases there's not as things evolve, but really hitting the roadblocks and getting to that zone of pride. I love that. Um, it, especially with this being in a zone of pride. I think everyone who is part of our session today You've achieved some amazing things, whether that's in a workplace, in your homes, 
Um, and I think that's what we want you to take away is continuing that zone of pride. So I love that, David. I think that's fantastic. Um, for Larry, you know, you often tell your clients retirement is just the beginning. Uh, what kind of support do you suggest for our attendees so that they can navigate this new beginning um, outside of maybe, you know, you know, what kind of support do you suggest that they find um, and how did you navigate that change for yourself um, going from a CEO to a sailor to an author and coach? Yeah, um, well, it was interesting because I had never seen anybody walk away from everything like I did uh, or sail away, actually, <laughs> but uh, I didn't have a role model. And I didn't have any guidance as to how to do it. So I just um, I just decided that I wanted to do this. I had, si since I was 13 years old and learned to taught myself to sail, I had had this vision and this passion that I wanted to sail around the world. And of course, you know, as a kid that everybody has that, but I kept that passion alive. And it took me 33 years in, you know, as life happened in my and business, until I was able to to leave everything. Um, and that was just for the chance at making that dream come true, because most people who set off to sail around the world don't make it. So it was risky. I knew it was risky and it was scary, but I learned about how to deal with fear. And I think that, you know, we, we haven't talked yet about fear, but fear is a is a really big uh, part of this whole process. And um, I try to teach people that, uh, transitions, any transition that we're going to make, like when I went from CEO to sailor, everything begins with an end. So all transitions begin with an end. I know it sounds counterintuitive. This is the work of William Bridges. Um, and there, once you have an end to something, then you find yourself in this neutral zone, the second phase of transitions, where you're exploring and you're searching and you're seeing what it is that you want to do if you don't know. Uh, in my case, I was just driven, and I had that one asset that really made it happen, and that was passion. I had passion for that dream. So once someone finds in that searching uh, middle transition, um, I call it a circle, they will find the new beginning. And that's when you, you know, that's when Julie Andrews comes running over the hillside singing, The Hills Are Alive. And the birds are chirping and everything is beautiful. And then you then you find what it is that you want to do. Um, and I also was a bit lucky. When I got back from my sailing trip, I was contacted by a couple of friends who were CEOs. And they asked me for some advice. And I said, sure, I'll give you some business advice. You know, like, like David, I had, I had was a CEO. I had some experience. And they said, no, no, no. We just want to know how you got out. How did you make that transition? And so that's what got me into coaching. It was, I was kind of forced into it by the, you know, just by one phone call, but I was being, I was open to everything. So I think that is something is to be open to all possibilities. Thank you, Larry. Um, my next question is for Coretta. Um, when you retired from engineering, how did you leverage your significant experience after you retired? Um, did you parlay your experience into a new path? We have some questions here in the Q&A about, you know, going into that consulting side. How did you turn your, um, your, your long expertise into these kinds of opportunities? So I was able to um, take what I did uh, during my career and use it in my volunteer work and also um, in consulting. So from a volunteer standpoint, you know, I've done project management, I've led teams, et cetera. And so I um, was able to parlay that over to a lot of the things that I do from a volunteer standpoint, taking on leadership roles. Um, um, because I have a little bit more time to lead now. <laughs> and so, um, uh, that's one way that I did it. Consulting, um, I guess consulting, when you're a consultant, it's, um, I guess for me, and kind of in the engineering world, it's just a sense of kind of using your expertise, but it's a bit laid backness because going back to what Larry and David said, there's a beginning 
and an endpoint when you take on a consulting position as opposed to a full-time job. So you can consult for six months, a year, two years, three years, but normally there is a defined uh, period of time that you're consulting. So while you're able to leverage your expertise, um, it feels like you're a little bit more, I guess, kind of laid back because um, you may have some of the same uh, pressures that you had when you were working full time, but um, you do know that there will be an end uh, end point um, that can be consulted and I mean renegotiated to continue on, but at least you know there's an end point. Um, well, you know, I want to give us a lot of time in our conversation to dig into some of these questions that folks are asking us. Um, but I want to start us off with a question. I think also that we've had we had some submitted questions prior to this, but I think also we have some other questions that are being submitted as we've been going along. Um, what tips or suggestions do you have for someone concerned about working with younger colleagues and teams, maybe re-entering the workforce and concerned about, you know, what it's like dealing with um, potential age discrimination. Does anybody want to take a shot at it first? I'll take a quick shot at that. Um, I believe that what we, what elders or seniors, what we bring to the table is wisdom. And there's a difference between the younger people have knowledge. I mean, this is that, you know, they have knowledge about what they're doing in their business, but what an older person brings is wisdom to the table. And I like to think of it this way. If you, you know, think what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad, right? So when, what we, when we come into a company, uh, and as Coretta says too, as a consultant, we come in with multitudes of experience. And it was like, we, oh, I've seen that before. I know what to do here. I've seen that before. I know what to do here. And we have people skills that the that younger people don't have. So it's a matter of just embracing the fact that you have this wisdom and using that as a benefit, but not trying to uh, force the knowledge on the younger generation which ha who have that. I'd like to jump in on that. I'll take a slightly different perspective than Larry in that. I, I, well, I do think those of us who are 50 have wisdom. We also have to be careful not to uh, talk about the good old days or mm. try to say that they don't have wisdom while we do. I think it's important to, if a, if a worker enters, and I, you know someone that was on the last panel that's at Amazon at the age of 60 years old, um, the idea was it was out there, it was obvious, but he never acted as if he were older. He got to know younger people. It's like, make sure not to separate yourself from the younger employees, get to know them. Uh, and I think that they will count on you for your wisdom, but don't separate yourself any more than you need to, or really make a big deal because most of us will be working for someone possibly half our age. That's okay. I mean, they bring a lot to the table too. They're, they're digital natives. They grew up on technology. Right. So I, I like to think of as much as we can, let's all try to lessen the generational differences and learn from each other. And ultimately, if you're starting with a bunch of younger people, get to know them. People crave learning from each other and it can be mentoring and reverse mentoring all at the same time and while you're both learning a lot and producing a lot on the job. So I would say, keep positive when you meet a younger generation. They'll probably respect you for still going out there and working into your 50s or maybe 60s. Yeah, good points. Yeah, just piggybacking a little bit on what David said. Just remember, you can learn from them. While yeah. you have wisdom, you can definitely learn from them. There's a lot of new things out there um, that you've probably never heard of. <laughs> um, yeah. If you have kids, maybe you have, but uh, you can learn from them. I'll, I'll just give you a quick story. Um, when I first went into the workforce many, many, many years ago, um, I was managing uh, men that were the same age as my dad and I had a rough time with that. And I actually went to a couple of guys and said, you know, I can't tell you what to do. And basically they said, well, yes, you can because we're a team and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Now 
the shoe is on the other foot. If I were in a workplace, you know, there'd be the younger engineers there. And I have to make sure that I don't talk to them like they're um, my child. I have to give them the respect. And as was mentioned, if I'm working for them, I have to make sure that they understand that they are in charge and they would tell me what to do. So just make sure you understand you can learn from them and really don't treat them like uh, they are your kids, the younger uh, mid mid career and new uh, new workers. Yeah, I love that idea of of learning from each other and yeah. going sharing back and forth. I mean, you know, who who knew that a file wasn't a Manila folder? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this cross generational respect, I think, yeah, is going to be yeah. more and more and more of an issue going forward, which is you'll be kind of assessed if you're the older person starting in that role or the older person in your 50s or 60s, they will very quickly see if you're a resistor or someone that actually has some respect for them. And I think yeah. that'll, that'll determine your fate in the organization. Exactly. I and I would, I would echo, don't talk about the good old days because <laughs> the mid-career and younger yeah. people, they don't care that you had a secretary to help you do your typing. <laughs> just don't care. <laughs> yeah. So true. yeah. The, the worst thing to say is, well, back in my day, back in I, the day, yeah. Well, and thank you. I actually am a I'm a millennial, but I also I actually feel very similarly to some of the things that you said because I am learning new technology every day as well. And so yeah. we are all learning, and it, there is this need for more intergenerational collaboration because there is so much that we learn from each other. Um, and, and you know, there. I, I so value your perspective because I think it also helps me too, as I'm working with those who are younger than me and also working with those older than me, you know, we're all learning. And I think that being in a posture of cur curiosity has been, I think, the best asset for those that I've worked with is just what can we learn from each other and how can we get better? And um, also it, 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 it keeps us young. Agreed. Right? I mean, their Agreed. energy, the younger people's energy, and it's like, you know, putting the old dog in with a puppy, you know? <laughs> there's, the, the, there's the energy, but also what the, the awareness that a younger workforce has is they, they're more aware of new companies or new business models or new technologies that you can quickly write a note and look it up yourself later and thumb. Oh, okay. You know? That's right. So, yeah, good point. Lots we learn across generations. Love it. Um, well, one question, I think this has been a common question that's actually is coming up is this thought of, okay, great, you have your thoughts and ideas about what you want to do, but you have a spouse or a partner who has different ideas. And so um, anybody want to take that? I think someone mentioned if, you know, Larry, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, um, sure. Like how do you balance like two people having to have different visions for what they want to do for it? Yes, that, that can be a challenge. Um, uh, communication is number one. I mean, you, you have to be communicating. Um, occasionally, I will coach couples, but usually it's individually, one at a time. <clears throat> and sometimes, uh, I'll give you an example. I had um, one client who really wanted to go on an ocean cruise across the Pacific Ocean from, I don't know, LA, I guess, to Singapore or something. And the spouse uh, got seasick and, and didn't want to ever go on an ocean cruise. So the compromise was, let's, is they did a bunch of river cruises through Europe. So they were still on a cruise, but she didn't have a chance of getting seasick on that. Um, so I think communication is, is important, but they also, it's important to remember, you don't have to be doing the same thing. You can be on parallel, you know, you can be on separate tracks going parallel and encouraging each other to enjoy what they're doing and not that they don't have to do exactly what you're doing. Great, thank you. I, I would go say, ahead. I'm gonna uh, piggyback on communication, but I'll go down a different, a little bit different path and I'll preface my statement with, I don't have a spouse and I've never had a spouse, but I've talked to a lot of my peers, friends, colleagues um, that, that retire and the spouse continues to work or vice versa. Communication is key because if one partner retires, 
and the other partner goes to work, it, that other partner that's working every day could very quickly get jealous that the one partner gets up or doesn't get up, still in the bed when they're like leave for work. But when you come home and ask, how is your day? They've been at the golf course, they've been at the gym, um, and you've had a challenging day, but they've done everything leisurely. So communication is the key because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, go ahead and retire. Um, and you're continuing to work. And then you don't have that jealousy factor. I mean, some people will just sit at home and watch TV if they're retired while their spouse works, but you have to be kind of on the same page. Some, some people will uh, have the retired spouse take the role of um, planning the meals, um, but you have to communicate um, if one spouse is continuing to work and the other, the other um, retires. Can I jump in on that one again, which is that it could be the other way around because um, there's a there's a common mistake that people make when they're retiring, and that is um, mistaking pleasures for fulfillment. So the person who's working actually might feel that they have purpose and fulfillment, and the purpose at, and person at home is just experiencing pleasures, going to the gym or golfing. That doesn't give you the same uh, self-actualization feeling that purpose and fulfillment does. So, you know, it can be the other way around. So again, communication is key. Good points. Yeah, I'll just build on what both Craig and Larry said in that communication is a big part of it, but I think it's also really having an honest talk about finances that plays mm -hmm. into this. If you are used to double income and one partner or the other is suddenly not working, how does that play into your long-term retirement plans if you're at that stage or if you're not? I think those have to be really honest conversations that are often very difficult, and you may need to bring in a specialist for that, but I've certainly encountered it, and it's very familiar, and it, it causes tensions, and so being open about what your expectations are, what their expectations are, and really carefully mapping out something that will be financially feasible for your, your partnership or marriage going forward. Very good point. Um, this is actually a question for Larry, but I think other folks can jump in too. Any thoughts for people who are still in a burned out phase? So any thoughts about how they can reframe or move forward, but they're still burned out? And and they're still at the and, and they're at the same job. Sure, maybe. Yeah. I, they didn't say, but I'm just saying, but mentally they're burned out. So whether they're moving on to something new or Maybe they're moving on from what burned them out. Any yeah. thoughts for that? Yeah. Um, Larry, call Larry. There, <laughs> there's, yeah. Uh, I burned out. Um, I had the best job in the world. I was I was traveling all over the world and I mean, doing, running events and it was great. And I still burned out. But what I found is the biggest obstacle to moving on to the next thing was fear. Uh, and and it, again, I'm, I'm coming back to fear because it, it, it has a big, plays a big role here. Um, what I try to do is to is to get my clients to put together. We put together a small plan of action that clearly outlines what's next, what you know, what they're going to do next. And as soon as someone takes the first step towards their plan, then that usually takes care of the fear. Then then they're off and running. Um, but I think also people are afraid of things that they needn't be. I mean, fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, fear makes you sharper and alert and focused. And, and I think it's nature's way of making you focus on the task at hand. But the burnout, I would say, try to look for new aspects of what it is that you're doing. Um, or, or maybe if you're on a job working for a company, maybe you can shift to a different role in the company. And again, now we're talking about, you know, not retiring there. But if someone's retiring, I think they have to take that first step of not to be afraid of leaving that comfort zone. Because people are in there, even when you're working at a company, you're in a comfort zone where you've got a paycheck and, and you've got a job and you have an identity of what you are, what you, what you do. 
And don't be afraid of, of leaving that and going on to the next thing. And, and don't be afraid of going down the wrong path. You know, um, I find that people are just not willing to take the risk of leaving that comfort zone, like as, as Dave has mentioned, uh, even financially. Okay, Our, we won't have two incomes. We'll have one income. That can be a fear, but what are we going to do about it? And make a plan and take that first step in the in the plan. I hope that helps. I'll build, I'll build on what uh, Larry just said, and said, which was to think, I'd say, number one, let's think about what is the burnout? What really caused it? So I'd say the first thing is, did it be, was it, is it caused by your job or because of really what we all experienced throughout the world, which was COVID burnout, which was, you know, back to back, nonstop bad news and so forth. I mean, I've heard 28 year olds tell me that they've got burnout, not just 38, 48, 58 mm -hmm. and 68. So I'd say, first of all, are you sure you're burned out on your job? Do you just need to do something new? Do you need to learn something new? I mean, I, I have found that I both, I feared going back to graduate school at 58, yet I've never felt more energized and alive because I'm in a class full of people that range in age, learning something new. So I would say, if you have burnout, is it is it long-term or situational? Maybe it's just this job. Maybe this particular job that you're in is causing burnout, or maybe it's only because COVID made your job so much harder. You know, not everyone's job got easier because of Zoom. I would say it uh, and video conferencing, in some cases, it became even more draining. And I think everyone's eyesight uh, suffered because of two years of Zoom. But, you know, there's trade-offs. So I would say, look at what's burning you out and see if there isn't something else that has uh, nurtured you in the past. Is it education? Is it going to a museum? Is it just getting out of your head and some other way that's just something different and unique that you could explore locally. And, and sometimes that makes a difference or just learning something, not necessarily a degree, but you know, UCLA and throughout the UC system, there's opportunities to, to learn more, take a few classes in something. Sometimes that can help with the reset. Thank you. Um, and also speaking of learning something new. So we have actually a couple of questions here talking about AI and how, the it is changing the vista of retirement or even how this could impact um re-entering the workforce anyone have thoughts about what they've seen with ai and how that's impacting the landscape now so i would say make sure you're educated on ai yeah. um sounds like uh, just some speak, but make sure you're educated on AI because if you believe everything that's in the media about AI, you will be intimidated and fearful about AI. So make sure you're educated. And there's of course many different ways to get educated on what uh, um, in AI. I um, use it. Yeah, use it. Um, but I, I would just say make sure make sure you're educated. Yeah. Make sure you're educated in, in, in artificial intelligence um, because it, it can be intimidating if you believe everything you hear, mm -hmm. like anything else. Agreed. It'll just like any other revolution when when really people started using personal computers or people started using video conference. Certain jobs were eliminated and certain jobs were created. And I would say there's more job creation through innovation than there is loss over time. And so to your point, Coretta, learning what the realities are, knowing that, yeah, I'll, there's a lot of change because of AI and chat GPT and everything tied to that. There's also going to be a lot of opportunity to simplify things, to improve processes, to get things done um, using AI that you, you would have taken you hours. Now you can move on to what you do best because other things you're able to use. Um, AI to help you for. So don't don't fear everything. It, work with it. Learn about it, as Coretta said and, and Larry said. It's don't, I like to say, don't be a digital resistor. Mm. One way yeah. to see current over 50, 55 is just don't resist, learn and embrace as much as you can. Yeah. If you were looking to uh, you know to write a, a blog or a book or or something, um, look at it as a positive. It can help you come up with a new book title. I mean, you know, something as simple as that. Yeah, or learn about 
some industry that you've always wanted to do would have taken you hours of research, right. just Googling something. And now instead, AI can get you that answer quick. Or, or if you want to change careers, I would say mm -hmm. there's exactly. you can learn a lot more quickly. But one of the things that, that we talked about before the session started is I always believe that if you don't know what you want to do, reach out to either people in the alumni network, uh, wherever you are in the UC, and whether it's someone in your class or maybe someone younger, just get a short 15-minute call to get an idea of what they do. Your job description is never going to look particularly good, right? You look at it like, oh, I've done some of those things. That looks like too much. Talking to people is where you start, your, your, your ideas start firing, right? You start thinking about, oh, that sounds interesting. Oh, that that sounds more interesting when I'm talking about it and reading the job description. A lot of things that are out there and posted, um, first of all, don't count on job postings because like 20 to 30 percent of, of uh, what's out there is, is it's, it's only a small percentage of what's actually available. By the time you see something posted online, odds are there's already internal candidates in there. So if you're trying to make a job transition, just looking at what's posted, posted online, whether you're 18, 28, 38, 48, 58, you're going to be really depressed just looking at job postings. Mm -hmm. It's all in the conversations and connection. And AI will never replace that. It will augment what we'll do, but human connection will probably help you figure out, you know, with quick 15-minute Zoom calls, what something's all about. You ask a couple of great questions, you thank someone for their time, you send a thank you note, and you've saved hours of uh, research and potentially heartache. And you may find something within your your own company. If you're still working, yeah. you, you you I mean, and you're burned out, you can try to shift to a different department or a different direction. You know, um, uh, in in the same company, talk to HR. Maybe you burned out and you just need an extra day a week, and and maybe they would be happy to only have you there for four days instead of five. Um, we have another question is, how do you advise others on balancing in retirement the desire to do something on purpose while also trying to just relax and explore personal passions? Um, there's a lot of this, you know, the, uh, some of these questions really is of like, you know, I am actually really happy with where I am, but I, you know, I'm balanced. How do I balance that personal side along with um, doing something purposefully and finding meaning in work too. I'll jump on that one. Okay. Um, the, again, the, the, there is a mistake made often, um, mistaking pleasures for purpose and fulfillment. And there is a balance. You, you know, you definitely want to uh, have both. There's nothing wrong with not having a purpose to everything you do but also you need to have purpose in some things that you do. And there, it is, it is a balance and it is a matter of just what I try to get people to do is to, again, make a plan and look at it on paper and say, okay, on Mondays and Tuesdays, I can do this on, on Thursdays. I'm going to do this on Fridays. I'm going to do nothing and leave it open. That's okay. It's great. Just have a little bit of a plan and take the first step on that plan. Great. Um, I, we have some questions here also really around getting involved. Um, first, I want to answer James here who asked, how receptive are UCLA alumni, so, alumni associations to retirees who just want to get involved? I want to tell you, we want you to get involved so very badly. We, <laughs> our students, our alumni, we need mentors. We need folks that have the experience that all of you have. In you know, in many of our students and young alumni, they actually are, you know, there's we've actually talked with some faculty members. Our our students really are dealing with different mental health issues and you know being able to overcome what we've all gone through. But you know, I think you know, how do they get, you know, how do they move forward? How do they persist? How do they pick themselves up and you know, overcome things that didn't go the way they thought they would. And there is a great need for mentorship. There's a great need for also just, you know, this sponsorship of those that want to reach the heights that you all may have already, but want to hear how you've done it. And so we, I know we have alumni association in all of our UCs, 
want to hear, get your insights, want to get you involved, um, whether that's also getting involved in a network in your area. You know, if you have time to provide leadership for your areas, you know, that's also something too that we greatly desire. Um, and so, you know, definitely um, I, we have, if you can get involved with your alumni associations, that's our big plug is we want to keep you connected to your alma mater and your institutions. So, and, um, Gloria, yeah. I'm just going to add to that because I think some of the statements that you're saying may be foreign to some some uh, of Please. the alum, you know, alumni Please. network, et cetera. I would say just simply call your alumni association and say, I want to get involved. Can I? Can we have a Zoom meeting? And you can learn a lot about the alumni association, the ways you get involved, what a network is, um, um, networks that are close to you, um, the different things that your alumni association um, offers. So I would just simply say, call your alumni association. Someone's going to pick up the phone. Just tell them, I want to get involved. You don't know how you want to be involved. Maybe you know you want to mentor, but maybe you want to hear what, what's being offered. So that's what I would say. But all the alumni networks across all the UCs would uh, gladly uh, love to hear from you. And I, I just say that um, I've never been disconnected from the school since I graduated in 1983. So the other good thing about that is when new buildings have gone up on campus, you know, it wasn't 10 years since I've been on campus and I'm just shocked how things have changed. I've seen all the change at UCLA, a lot, you know, all good, all for, all for the good. So that's another thing about getting involved um, on campus and you'll meet other alum and that might develop into other relationships mm -hmm. also. Yeah, alumni networks get strong by people raising their hand or as Coretta said, letting the, the alumni office, wherever you, whatever you see system you're with, know that you're available. You might not hear from them right away because they might have to kind of put you on a list of Okay, here's a list of volunteers, and we'll get back to you. It might be a couple months, but at least you've raised your hand, mm -hmm. and that's really what makes so much of um, whether it's Anderson's uh, alumni network or the UCLA or any of the UC system. It's the volunteers that really drive, I think, uh, the purpose and continue the mission and keep people engaged. So, reach out and let people know what you're able to do. And I would also say, because this does intimidate a lot of alum, don't be intimidated by uh, philanthropy. Oh, they're going to want me to give something. They mm -hmm. want your time. They want your time. If you're able to give resources, that'd be great, but they really want your time. So don't be intimidated by the philanthropic part of calling up the Alumni Association because they'll ask you to give something when you call. No, they want your time. Um, so I do want, I, I know we weren't able to get to all of the asked questions that were in the Q&A, but I did want to end our session today with, you know, our each of our panelists sharing one last piece of feedback or advice or encouragement for our audience. Um, and so in 60 seconds or less, what is one thing you really want our audience to walk away with today? Um, anyone want to go first? I'll, I'll start. Okay. Sorry. And then you'll go, you'll go next, David. Yeah, I, I'll just say while you're working, think about what you want to do in retirement. Don't get to age 50 um, or 55 and start thinking about retirement. If you are at age 50 or 55, you really want to think hard and you may want to, and this is no plug, you may want to get a coach to help you because um, you don't want to get to the point where you get to quote unquote retirement age and you feel you need to stop working and then you try to figure out what you want to do. So I'd say think about what you want to do in the future while you're still working. Thanks, Greta. Thank Agreed. I, I would just add to that that there's no defined right way to do retirement. What it, or if you want to keep working like a lot of us are, mm -hmm. then that's fantastic. The great thing is there are so many options these days not just in terms of if you want to keep working sometimes in your 60s and 70s, you can probably do it. Or if you want to retire, you can. One of the benefits of working for the UC system is obviously the pension that we, we all still have. But I would say don't define 
success based on someone else's retirement or decision to keep working. And you credit, you said something to me yesterday, which was keep your networks alive, yeah. keep reaching out to people and, and building those friendships. And, and Larry, you said it too, keep yourself engaged and that will give you a richness that will help define what you want to do if you want to keep working or you want to retire. Yeah, good. Thank you, David. All right. Um, yeah, I'm, mine's quick. Um, what I see in a lot of retirees is loneliness, depression, and boredom. And I just want to offer the antidote to that. The antidote, in, I believe, is purpose, fulfillment, and community. So Agreed. stay engaged. All right, and there's no such thing as flunking retirement. I'm sure <laughs> you right. probably heard a lot of people say, I flunk retirement. Uh, because they retire, did. And then they find themselves going back to work. No, as Larry and David said, they've just repurposed themselves. Yes. And they found something else that they want to do. So there's no such thing as flunking retirement. Agreed. Just, just a change of course. Exactly. Yeah, but don't be afraid to take that, to take a step to, to, to make a change. You know, you can't steal second base unless you take your foot off of first. There's so many options. Yeah, exactly. Whatever you want, you can probably achieve it with a little bit of work. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for just this really enlightening time. You know, I think this uh, concept of also not letting fear get in the way. You know, fear is a very real thing, but also it's not the only thing and it's not, you know, there's more than that. And so thank you all for sharing your insights and your experiences and also what you've also learned from your journeys and those from those you've worked with and those you, you know, cared about and served. And so thank you for your time today. Um, on behalf of our University of California, thank you for joining us today um, for our webinar. Thank you to all. It was a pleasure to connect with everybody virtually. Um, and we appreciate all of you making the time to be part of today's event. And we hope you gained valuable insights and advice. Um, Myra did add into the chat um, UCLA did do a panel also on the same topic and so we invite you to watch just also to you know learn from uh those that share their experiences as well um so you know we also want to thank our panelists david larry coretta for your time and your generosity and your commitment to the university of california um it our conversation made me so proud to be a uh, part of our UC community. So thank you for taking the time today. Um, again, to our audience, we hope you take a few minutes to provide feedback on today's event uh, by following the survey gizmo link that appears on your screen when you launch today's webinar. Uh, your feedback will be used to help determine topics for future sessions. If you would like to get more involved or continue to engage with your alumni association, we'll also add the link to find more information on events and programs. Um, you know, they, your alumni associations do have tools to engage and, you know, raise your hand and network with other alumni. Um, and in addition, if there are ways that, um, if you, there are many other ways that alumni can give back, we invite you to sign up to be an alumni advocate for the UC uh, advice, Advocacy Network. The link will be in the chat, but you can definitely get involved in this way as well with the UC, uh, uh, the UC Advisory Network. Um, the Advocacy Network, I apologize. It's a digital grassroots community that focuses on issues that matter to UC staff, students, alumni, and faculty, and more. Um, and you can advocate. Uh, they, they speak in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. by helping the UC through actions like signing petitions and tweeting their support and email, emailing their elected officials. Um, and so, you know, that you work with people in the UC, California, and beyond. So sign, by signing up, you'll be alerted to take action and get be given resources and templates to take those actions. Um, and so we hope that you enjoyed today's conversation. Um, if there, you want to get in touch with our uh, our speakers today, we, there are links um, in their um, in their bios. But then also, you know, if you want to continue to work with some of them, like Mr. Larry here, um, there's also links and uh, freebies that he's also offering to our attendees that are uh, are here today. And so thank you to Larry uh, for that. Uh, thank you, David, for your amazing insights as a fantastic coach. And Coretta, you know, again, thank you for your great insights as well. Someone who's gone through the process, but also continuing to give back and raise her hand and 
um, be such an amazing force on the UCLA campus and also with the UC. So thank you all for your time today. We hope you attend further uh, webinars from the UC Alumni Career Network. Uh, but until then, we hope to see you soon and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Take care.